and welcome into a victory edition of spits and suds as the dallas stars double up the new york rangers handing the rangers their first regulation loss in just about a month since october 19th hey everybody i'm gavin spittle and i'm so glad to be joined by our friend of spits and suds david castillo writes for d magazine you got to read and support david at david castillo ac on twitter and or x and you can also read him on his sub stack which is at stars stack so david good evening how are you sir i was i was doing great until you mentioned you said x instead of twitter just call it twitter Let's i know i know you're right you're right <laughs> i know you're right i you know i'm trying trying to be the nice guy to old elon but uh i agree we still all we Don't. still all look at the bird we still all refer to it <laughs> also the other the oh sorry about that i was just gonna say the other thing which is victory don't forget victory over a good team yes for a change <laughs> yes yes absolutely sir this was the first quality opponent victory this year kind of an argument could be made against winnipeg because when they played you know winnipeg was kind of on fire and the possibility that winnipeg could have jumped up past the stars in the division standings but you know, this was a very impressive New York Rangers team who got out of the gates quick and uh, were up two to nothing. And then the stars came barreling back. We have so much to talk about, David. You know, first, I want to prop you up because I think you were one of the lar- uh, loudest people in the room as far as not being against the stars changing up lines. And they did it tonight. Robertson paired with Dodonoff and Wyatt Johnston. Hence, Jamie Ben moves on to that line with Joe Pavelski. Wanted to get your thoughts on that. Well, I appreciate the uh, the shout. You know, I've been wrong about so many things, like Julius Honka, for example. It's it's nice to be uh, sort of justified if just for one night, um, because it's it to me. And I've been making this argument since uh, the Rick Bonus era, uh, just because I feel like to me, I look at the way. And you see the way Hints impacted Ben, for example, and Pavelski. I just think Hints and Robertson. Robertson maybe is going to require some more discussion because he's having kind of a wonky-ish season, but still yep. very productive. I, I like. I don't. In fact, he rates extremely well defensively, which is odd because I feel like I don't notice that. But I'm not also looking for it, which is I think kind of part of the value of quote unquote analytics. But um, I, I thought it was great, and I've always wanted to see that. I think precisely because these are elite players on their own. So I don't think, uh, you know, you're going to have an issue with their chemistry with others, because I, I think it's it's less about chemistry and just more about interlinking skills. These guys can make plays, they can shoot the puck. Um, in, in Hintz's case, he can make plays, shoot the puck, and is extremely fast. And so whoever you put them with, their game is going to be elevated as a result. Yeah, and they kept intact the line that, as well, they should keep intact of uh, Mason Marchment, Matt Duchesne, uh, as well as Tyler Sagan, and they were at it again. Um, I was interested also to get your take on Jake Ottinger taking the night off. I mean, we have heard from Pete DeBoer, you know, that this season they are going to rest Jake Ottinger more and kind of lesson and really keep an eye on that load management. I found it interesting. I mean, kudos to Scott Wedgwood stepped up big time. I think Wedgwood's played excellent this year. I know last year he had the injury, uh, 33 shots on net stopped 30 of them. Uh, you know, one of them was with 15 seconds left. So overall a great effort from uh, Wedgwood. And at the same time, you know, you give Ottinger uh, some rest. I did find the timing, you know, odd because against the Rangers against the Sturkin, even though goalies don't really face each other and you know Ottinger has had rest since the last time they played was you know Saturday so um you know he he did get a couple of days so you know I just I thought it was interesting but kudos to Wedwood <laughs> aren't we always going to have this sort of low-key yes. controversy with Dubor and goalies ever going back to his time in Vegas yes. which is I think maybe sort of a little incidental like I, I don't think it's Dubor has some questionable really I, I think it's just kind of how things have, have shaken up but I mean I think ultimately it's we know who Andre is he's the starting goaltender of the Dallas Stars and when the playoffs roll around 
we know exactly who's going to start every single game. And so, yeah, to your point, I mean, as long as they manage and kind of focus on the amount of games um, that he plays, which is to say not too many, um, I'm I'm not really – like who they play is less interesting to me as – as what the backup is able to do and the confidence that they can grow. Because, I mean, like, not just like, I mean, Wedgwood has been, I think, pretty consistent his entire time here. And that's a hard thing to do as a backup. I think it's one of the reasons why Anton Hudobin was such a uh, such a miracle, which is that, you know, it's, it's hard when you play so little, it's hard to be consistent, right? Isn't this what we give Joel Hanley credit for? Sure. Even though, like, even though I'm not like, the biggest Hanley fan. But, I mean, it's just, it's, I, I, I like seeing Wedgwood against the odd, not softball. And and I think that's going to, I mean, I think that's, isn't that part of what Hudobin's run was fueled by? The fact that he was a player that got in a few more games than you would expect out of a quote-unquote backup and so when it was time for him to show up, he showed out. And you never know. You know, just something happens to Ottinger, it's the playoffs, and Wedgwood's got to start. I mean, these are the kind of games that I think Wedgwood needs to to really feel that um, that validation. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Your three stars of the game, by the way, Mason Marchment uh, had a goal and an assist. Joe Pavelski, goal and an assist. Rupe Hentz, goal, two assists. So, uh, good night for those three. You know, Mason Marchman's a completely different player, but I mean, we've talked about this, but uh, boy, you you look at, you know, the resurgence of Jamie Ben partnered with Wyatt Johnston. Uh, are we now talking about the resurgence of, not that Sagan was bad last year, but we're just seeing a different player paired with Matt Duchesne and the same with Marchman. I mean, listen, we could say it. It's Matt Duchesne. It's the Duchesne effect. Whatever you it want. Is. It's it's because Marchman and Sagan, you know, it's it's like the Mean Girls thing. Like they wanted Marchman and Sagan to be a thing. They weren't. And that's not to say. And, and one of the things that, that I've kind of been uh, sort of writing about or, or starting to kind of write about is, is that I don't think it's as simple as like, well, Duchesne is just he's forcing the others to be good. Because I do think, especially if you look kind of beneath the numbers and uh, Sagan, especially defensively, he's a player that, I mean, he's on pace for 60 plus points and he's doing the work defensively, being responsible. Even this game in the first period, he had a great um, uh, takeaway. Um, I, I think it was on Panarin. I'm not sure who it was on, but um, um, it, it does feel like a line that has chemistry, even though <laughs> it's a line that would only have chemistry with Duchesne, but um, yeah, you know, credit to them. You know, it's it's like a like a solid bass player and a band known for its guitarists and vocalists. Oh, nice. Um, they they have they they have they have that that flow and that rhythm. And yes, there is a clear cut leader <laughs> among them. But um, but that's not to say. I mean, they're third in the with among all trios with at least 100 uh, minutes of ice time. They are third in share of shot quality. Um, so yeah, the, I mean, the line's great. <laughs> Don't break yeah. them up. Yeah. A, a couple of, uh, interesting calls in this game that I wanted to ask you about. The first was the on the ice non goal called goalie interference by Mason Marchment that was overturned. The replay clearly showed that that puck was free. I thought when they first said no goal, because I thought, I thought they blew a whistle. Uh, that's the only thing I could think because I said that's n-. and when they said goaltender interference before I even saw the replay I was like no that's not goalie interference but you never know in today's NHL it's like pass interference you just don't know you know this is it, this is a great this game is a great example of why hockey lags behind the other sports which even I mean have you ever seen a goal called back on account of interference in which the only thing separating the goalie and the player was like the stick in the puck. It was bizarre. It was even yeah. called to begin with. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it must've been the, it had to be the angle. They couldn't see the puck, but I mean, I just don't understand like, like what did the, what did they see to call goaltender interference? That's what I was wondering, especially coming off Saturday night with that call, you know, that the stars appealed. I thought that might have been more goaltender interference. 
Yeah, no, ex- yeah. And I do wonder too about, I mean, it's a, it's kind of the thing that, you know, we don't like to talk about and often don't talk about because, well, um, that rabbit hole is just, I don't know, like, uh, it, it can take you places, it can make you that sort of tinfoil hat where, which is the concept of reputations and players, um, uh, you know, with the refs. You And you've seen this, uh, you saw it especially in Toronto with Michael Bunting last year, who was always um you know he he wasn't just taking penalties but he was taking penalties and being a jerk to the refs and and that seemed to kind of fuel the kind of calls the the fact that he didn't get the benefit of the doubt um this is a player that's historically drawn a lot of calls um, i realize like nobody wants to hear about michael bunton right now but nonetheless like i, I think there is something to the fact that well maybe at least my theory Marchment doesn't have a great reputation. He is a player that takes a lot of penalties and and perhaps they just seen him too close to the goaltender, just didn't give him the benefit of the doubt in that split second. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, the other um at my parents' house, and as soon as it happened tonight, I looked at my dad and I said, I don't understand Peter Laviolette's decision on this. So the stars are up four to two. It's the second consecutive power play for the Rangers. And they pull Shesterkin. Now, I understand analytics might say it gives you a better chance, but you have the number two power player in the NHL. To me, when you're on the power play, that kind of gives the stars an added advantage because it doesn't matter. There's no icing. So therefore, you know, shooting the puck at the net. And one turnover on that power play is going to result in the goal. I understand it could pay off. Maybe he thought this is the game. I got to put the extra skater on the ice. But as soon as it happened, I just said to myself, I think the stars are going to score here. Yeah, it's it it almost feels like everybody in the NHL from the coaches to the owners recognize that officiating is crap. And so, you know what? Let's just roll the dice on this one because you never know. And I think that was Laviolette's thought process because, you know, he's an experienced coach, a cup winning coach. Um, And I think that was, especially in a game where I thought the Rangers were just kind of, you know, it was a, it was a byproduct of Dallas, I think being quite good um, despite how wonky the game was, but also New York, New York just being really bad at times. And so <laughs> you're down two goals, you know, just again, rolling the dice. And that, that's yep. more or less what that was, I think. Yeah, 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 a- absolutely. I mean, yeah, I thought I thought the coach's challenge for La Violette on that one, which um, was denied and they got, you know, I mean, I was fine with that. I just, I don't know. I just didn't understand it four to two. I'm like, give your power play a chance. Give your team a chance. There's four minutes left in the game. You score one goal, you're down by one. So, uh, but, you know, I mean. He's got them off to a good start. It, it, it is interesting to watch them, David, because at times I could see why the New York Rangers have been dominant this year. And at times I could see why the stars were going to pull off the victory tonight. I mean, you know, first period, boy, they were coming at you. You pointed it out on Twitter. They're they're coming and they're sending four guys and they're coming hard and they're deep on the four check. Um, and the stars in the first period allowed some of the Rangers behind them, which as well as odd man breaks. So kind of a tough first period defensively. Uh, I think, you know, Wedgwood kind of kept them in the game with some good saves. Um, but I think the stars cleaned that up. And I think as the game moved along, the Rangers were the one that got sloppy in their own zone. You know, it, Stars fans won't like to hear this, but in York's defense, they were missing their number one defenseman and yep. their second line center. So, I mean, I, I think that explains some of the funkiness to New York's game. But um, but I also think that, you know, some of this is just kind of um, uh, sort of a long time coming for Dallas. Um, you know, one of the things uh, that I uh, mentioned in my um, little sort of post-game analysis after the Colorado game is that, uh, so, you know, prior to tonight, right, in Dallas's five losses, all good teams, um, the uh, which will in three games, Dallas had a 60 percent expected goal share. So, you know, it's not like, listen, just because you win the expected goal share battle doesn't mean you uh, should win that game. But I think 60 percent is that's a pretty high number. Um, so um, so I, I do feel like some of it's just been kind of 
luck or lack thereof for Dallas. And, and they were going to beat one of these good teams eventually. Um, but it was definitely just also kind of that, like I said, I, I think DeBoer's shakeup of the Lions really paid off. A little less of a fan of <laughs> seeing Lindell and Hockenpah sort of become <laughs> that second pair again. But you know what? I just, oh, I'm just going to take the win and kind of move on. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. And you're right. Adam Fox did skate with the team, which is a good sign for the Rangers. He made the road trip, but not in the lineup. And that is a premier defenseman missing for the Rangers, uh, a perennial Norris Trophy candidate. So, Real quick, uh, yeah. I just put you on the spot. Do you think Heisken is better than Adam Fox? No. Ooh, that's... I know. I agree with you, actually, but I just, you know. <laughs> no, I. are going to call the. Uh... <laughs> on saturday night i did not i said and you might disagree with me on this i said miro is very good to elite as far as defensemen but cal mccarr is a game changer and the, i mean i just i feel uh you know i think i think miro is great for the stars i just look at some of these other players and offensively just I, I see a lot more out of them. I'm not trying to knock Miro because I think he's terrific. I just like offensively, I see these other players um just kind of taking the game over at points. Yeah, no, I I you know I, we you know we'll probably want to save time for the whole like Mike Madonna thing, but I, I would agree. I, I think McCarr and Fox McAvoy, I think these are three yeah. guys that can sort of on any given season be actually above Heisman. Um, yeah. And, and yeah, I think it's because, and that's not to say that ultimately like the, <laughs> the ambition for these guys is to win the cup. So us saying anything about Norris, maybe or about Heisken and not winning Norris has nothing to do with whether or not like Heisken has the ability to be a champion. Cause he absolutely does. And he is the best defenseman on a team that has cup aspirations, not just a cup contender, but a cup favorite. And that's, you know, First and foremost, but in a vacuum, yeah, I, I would say like McCarr and Fox, just a level. And I, they're also good defensively as well, too. I mean, I, like, I, I don't think it's we, we shouldn't undersell in the same way we don't undersell like Heisman's offense. Sure. I don't think we should undersell McCarr and Fox's defense because I, I do think these are all complete defensemen with like varying degrees of offense and defense, you know, for for their profiles. Yeah, I think I think it's great that he's in the conversation. I think Drew Doughty's having a uh, a comeback year. I think Victor Hedman's terrific. So I mean, there's a lot of good defensemen in the NHL right now. So you know, and Mir Miro's one of them. But uh, yeah, I, I do put Adam Fox uh, ahead of him. Okay. This episode is brought to you by Carvana. Carvana has made financing your next vehicle as smooth as can be, and you can do it 100% online. You can get pre-qualified in just two minutes, and you'll have real terms personalized just for you. Then you can browse up to thousands of car options on Carvana while seeing your actual terms and monthly payments as you shop. You can even add a co-signer to get flexible terms on even more vehicles. See how smooth it is to finance your car with Carvana. Visit Carvana.com or download the app to get pre-qualified today. Co-signer is available to qualified customers. For gifts that bring holiday joy, I head to Ulta Beauty. And that includes gifts for yours truly. Like this Dyson Airwrap, the statement gift of the season. Perfect for mom and for me. Here's a Floral Carolina Herrera fragrance and Tula skincare kit for my secret Santa. And ooh, I got these shimmery Pat McGrath and Tarte eyeshadow palettes for my friend Jen. And yep, for me. Shop the gifts that bring joy to everyone on your list this holiday season. Ulta Beauty. The possibilities are beautiful. This episode is brought to you by Starry. When you drink Starry Lemon Lime Soda, every sip is a win. Perfect for game time or any time. It's a crisp, refreshing lemon lime soda that's caffeine free and bursting with flavor that makes you go, ah. Starry hits different. Find it in stores or online today. The stars um, at the end of the second period announced that on March 16th a statue will be unveiled featuring the former captain Mike Madano and um, you David and I we were talking um, a little bit before we press the record button on this um, so David I personally have been on spits and suds and probably have mentioned a Madonna statue 
maybe six to 10 times. Like I felt very strongly because I felt as though not only is Mike Madonna, um, one of the greatest Americans to ever play. I felt as though he did two things. He came here and obviously he was dominant in his sport. He helped win a cup, but he was also a tremendous ambassador in the community as far as growing the great game. And uh, I've talked to Craig about this and he talks about how Madonna was very open and um, wanted to grow the game. So I think for those reasons, um, you know, we actually on 105.3 The Fan have asked Madonna about a statue in the past. And his response, I think, is very funny because we talked about, you know, in Nowitzki way. And he, you know, he very, you know, jokingly said, he goes, yeah, you know, he goes, you think they could find a cul-de-sac in DFW to name after me. So I think it's, <laughs> I think he's taken it in stride. Um, so I personally am very happy. And uh, I will let you give your thoughts before I go on my second soapbox about Madonna. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, like, uh, so there's, I feel like there are like many different discussions. I, I think one of the things that I will say in support of the Madonna statue, <laughs> of whatever it looks like, um, the, I guess for me, like, it, it's hard for me to separate kind of my personal connection with the Dallas Stars and hockey because. I think, I think what really separates Madonna from just your average, oh, here was a dude that won a championship for your team and was probably their best player, is the fact that, you know, it's it's not, you know, for hockey specifically, growing the game in the South is, is a significant factor. And there was nobody else <clears throat> other than Mike Madonna, who you could watch, who even people that didn't enjoy hockey could watch and understand because of his just his blister and speed, but also somebody you could watch and be like, oh, hey, there's that hockey player from the Mighty Ducks. You know, like this guy was in movies. You can't, sure. you don't even see that nowadays. I mean, like I realized, like, I think maybe like some people were in that um, Sean William Scott movie, Goon. Um, but um, but even then, like Connor McDavid in like a legit Hollywood movie, no. Austin Matthews, no. Right. But Mike Madonna in the 90s, yes. And yeah. that is, that is, pretty darn significant um so so I, I think it's i think it's totally justified I, I just and especially for what hockey is in dallas which is still relatively new but i'm really curious to hear what you think the statue is going to look like and what where it's going to rate on a scale of like one to ronaldo because that i think is ultimately like it's the test of any one of these statues sure because well, they I, always i i do like that the creator of the statue is the same creator of the Dirk Nowitzki statue. So I, I do like that aspect. I do like that they've met as a group and come up with the idea. So my two thoughts are the following. Um, one will be the Madonna picture of him raising the cup in 99, which I think would be a great statue um, because I think it does remind stars fans and just sports fans in general that that team kind of energized hockey in this area area for years to come um, because before this recent run uh there were a lot of drought years and um the second one i think if you're going to my second idea i think it will be the first idea of him raising the cup the other is the jersey kind of flapping the lettuce in the background you know, with that sweet lettuce hair he had, you know, flowing and just kind of that wind that he created with that speed. Um, that would lettuce. be my that would be my second one. I don't think I've ever heard anybody refer to hair as lettuce. That, that's a first for me. Oh, you haven't? Is this is this a northeastern thing? No, it's a no. <laughs> it's a hockey. <laughs> but you're in Massachusetts, right? <laughs> yeah, I'm in Massachusetts right now. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, it's uh it's kind of what uh, hockey players call for, like the flow. So, yeah. I, I I actually I think the second one. I, I think your idea for the second one is should be um, should be or what I would prefer at least to be. I, I realize like raising the cup is a big deal, but ideally, I, I think it's it would be kind of odd if Dallas doesn't win the cup in the next like two, three, five years, and and that sort of that statue 
kind of signifying like the one time you know ideally you want this player to represent like a franchise that is successful on the whole and so yeah i feel like just the focus on who madonna was as a player the jersey flap i, I think is actually more significant in a counterintuitive way than yeah. him raising the cup um and um and of course you know I, I'm, I'm always going to be a little bitter about uh 2000 um, I, I really felt like Dallas was the better team, and yep. um, and and of course there were years where I, I felt like Madonna was just I don't know I I still feel like he he could have had more and could have given more not because he didn't give enough because maybe the team just didn't kind of <laughs> make the yeah right I think et cetera I, I wish that I wish they didn't go through bankruptcy. Um, you know, Brad Richards had some tremendous years during the, you know, I mean, he turned out to be a great, he wasn't here long, but he was terrific when he was here. Um, but yeah, there were some tough teams. Um, and Madonna went through a drought um, as far as, you know, just the team in general um, went through a tough time. But I, I did want to address for Stars fans, and I can understand your passion for the local team. Um, but in my opinion, I think you need to take a step back and the bitterness toward Mike Madano being a part of the Minnesota Wild organization um, just because, you know, he's friends with general manager Bill Guerin. Um, they obviously have a close relationship, but Mike Madano didn't choose to leave here as a player. It was tough times and was told that he wouldn't be returning. So he went to his hometown team in Michigan. So, I mean, it didn't work out, but regardless, it wasn't like Mike Madonna was saying, please, I need to be out of here. And then he went to Arizona and did some work with the Coyotes, and that was based on raising his family, and he wanted to give his wife a chance at a pro golf career. So that's why they moved to Arizona, and he was involved you know, kind of fringe with the Coyotes organization. Then he did express an interest to come back to the stars. The stars chose not to bring him back into the organization, right or wrong. I mean, Jim Nill has the right to choose his staff. And, you know, therefore, an opening in Minnesota came open, and he took that. And obviously, there's a lot of history with Mike Madano and the state of Minnesota. So I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing. I just, you know, I want people to celebrate Mike Madonna, the player that was with the Dallas Stars, and not think. I just hate when Madonna, like he posted a picture with his kids on Twitter, and people were calling him a traitor because, you know, his kids were at the wild. And I mean, I know you agree on this one, David. I'm just like, come on, guys. You know, I mean, Mike Madonna was in the building tonight, you know, and, and I do want to shout out Brad Alberts, the president of the stars, because Brad Alberts was instrumental in bringing the winter classic here. Brad Alberts was instrumental in bringing the NHL draft here. And Brad Alberts has been instrumental on this. Brad Alberts has been celebrating the Dallas stars hall of fame. Now he helped create it where we can honor those players that are not going to make it into the hockey hall of fame but we'll make it into the Dallas stars hall of fame, which I'm pushing Craig Ludwig to be a part of that. So um, hopefully he gets in in the next year or two. So that's my piece with Mike Madonna. I'm happy for him. I'm excited that he's going to be here with his whole family. Uh, I think Madonna's personality is shine now um, in the last few years. Um, and so I like to celebrate the man that brought a lot of great memories to me. By the way, can we talk about the just very, very briefly the mechanics of sports logic, which is oh no, Mike Madano like taking a job in the front office at Minnesota, <laughs> but you know what? But Tyler Sagan's still hanging out with Brad Marchand. That's cool. And of course, Brad <laughs> Marchand is one of the dirtiest, low down dirt. You know, just come on, like let's let's be real about what network. Uh, sort of the the sports club is and, and you know kind of how this whole thing works um you know this is this is the guy that brought Dallas the only cup they have right now so yeah. show some respect <laughs> yeah absolutely I mean I bet if you took a poll and said would you rather see a Mike Madonna or Darian Hatcher statue I think Hatcher would win 
<laughs> yeah, which which would – Hatcher was one of my favorite players, but yeah. that would absolutely be the wrong choice. Yes, yeah, yeah. Hatcher yeah. wasn't even the third best defenseman. Like yeah. I would have had Zuboff – I would personally have Sador above Hatcher. Yeah. I mean, Hatcher, yes, he was critical to like, you know, sure. breaking people's faces and, and also <laughs> was quite talented as well. However, I think just on a just on a pound for pound ba- basis, I think Zuboff and Sador were better were better. And Mavchuk was darn good. I mean, he was right there with absolutely. Hatcher, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah. No, you're you're absolutely right. Love the way of course way lower yeah. down the list, but you know. yeah. I also want to add, David, that we should also take a step back and say this is great that a hockey statue is going to be at the American Airlines outside where people can celebrate hockey. This is a great step in the right direction as far as, you know, the hockey prominence in DFW. Um, you know, there's a statue for Dirk. It's great that there's now a hockey statue. So I think that's another celebration that Stars fans should be happy about. But not only that, but, you know, there was, I don't know if you uh, caught that, um, <clears throat> you know, to your point about, Brad Alberts and kind of what the stars are doing as an organization. You know, there was that comment when uh, reporters asked Austin Matthews about like, Hey, you know, would you like to go anywhere else in this global series? Um, you know, which some teams play in Sweden right now. And yeah, he mentioned Mexico city and I'm like, Oh, by the way, they have an, a potential opponent who has done a lot to grow the Latino fan base in Dallas with uh, Al Montoya, of course, yeah, um, you know, putting together, the Noche Mexicana, and, you know, that's been, like, huge, and it's just kind of, uh, you know, I realize, like, hockey fans are really awful gatekeepers, but, you know, at some point, nobody's going to take away your love of hockey or your history with the game. Let it go. Let yeah. other people enjoy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Accept yeah. new things. <laughs> yeah, guess what? Vegas and Seattle are playing an outdoor game. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the NHL 2023-24, you know? Listen, Zach, carolers. Huh, cool. But this is way cooler. This season, gift Samsung Galaxy Buds 2 Pro and surround the ones you love with the sounds they love with studio quality sound and intelligent active noise cancellation. Pair it with Galaxy S23 Ultra and power their listening experience with an epic smartphone. Shop these and more great gifts now at Samsung.com. Not all Brits are quiet and reserved, like in period pieces. In reality, they're full of spirit. Whether they're at the Fringe Comedy Festival, or watching the football, or seeing their favourite artists perform in Hyde Park, let Britain surprise you. Experience the best of British hospitality on your way to Great Britain with British Airways. Book now at ba.com slash visit Britain. All right, so we got some stars questions. We put it out um, during the third period and uh, wanted David to be involved in this. Uh, once again, please support David. His sub stack's called Star Stack, so you could look that up, and it's subscription-based, but David's going to give you a lot of analytics and nuggets and opinions that you're not going to find anyone else, anywhere else. And I, I will say I do appreciate those spits and suds listeners that, read david and d magazine that support him whether follow him on social media the same for sean shapiro um these guys have been great to spits and suds so we really want to what's that don't forget robert tiffin the d magazine yeah robert tiffin too yeah i have to have him on yeah great point yeah great point that's a great plug by you i'm just gonna call this spits and suds slash d magazine how's that <laughs> but you know what kudos to them they're hiring great great people that know a lot about hockey so um all right so i did <laughs> i did throw out a joke um and <laughs> i said um i asked you know where the craig ludwig statue should be next where would you put it <laughs> so uh ronald uh Ask on Twitter at Ronald Donald Ald. That is a long Twitter name. Can the Craig Ludwig song be a staple for the Spits and Suds contest? So, David, I went online on YouTube and I was just looking for a Craig Ludwig highlight and I played for Craig. Um, this someone when he was in Montreal, 
um, oh no, he was here in Dallas at the time, came up with a Craig Ludwig song. And so I played it for him and Craig said, what the F is that? He had never heard the song. So, um, you know, I, I'm still concerned about like, listen, functionally a Craig Ludwig statue can't work because of the shin pads. It's going to be too heavy. <laughs> right. I mean, isn't this the thing? Absolutely. Absolutely. And the NHL hall of fame still doesn't have those shin pads, um, <laughs> which is one of my favorite Lud stories where that he finally picks up the phone and he said, I'll give you the shin pads if I get to go in there as well. And they never called him back. <laughs> uh, Thack man, who's a big spits and suds, uh, listener. I would put a Craig Ludwig statue in the tunnel where the team comes in as an inspiration to them. Um, he says also good win, especially with the backup goalie. That is the quality win over a good team that this team needed. Yep. We both agree on that. Uh, Sam green at Spaniel green. Good win. Hope we can string a few together over this stretch. What did you think of the lines tonight? Would you have broken it up in a different way? Good question, David. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> was that the <laughs> was that the guy's name? Was his name David? Cause you said, good question, David. I'm like, I didn't ask anything. Adam. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that was at Spaniel yeah. Green. The question yeah. is, would you have broken up the lines in a different way? And I figured you could start off there. I think, you know, honestly, it's it's funny because as much as I like sort of advocate for and have advocated for many, literally years, uh, split up the hints line, I, I would have started out differently. I would have tried. To me, I always go back to Sagan has always looked good next to Robertson and Pavelski. And you keep that. And I think you go with, um, hints with Duchesne and Marchman. That's how I would have personally done it, just because I feel like the speed, <laughs> the combo of like hints and Duchesne, I, I just think would be um, absolutely like unmatched. And, and I don't see any team defending that consistently. Um, but obviously, Ben hints with Kowalski. The only thing I'll say is that like I'm not, I'm not, you know, listen, I'm not ready to anoint them just yet. Um, so I, I think. I don't know. It's 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 hard to get this wrong. Like the team is just that deep. They have what seven players that are on track or on pace, theoretically, to score twenty goals, which is obscene. Um, so it's kind of hard to really go wrong. And a fourth line that um, that is also doing its job, shutting yeah. them along. I mean, nobody talks about the fourth line, but they are dominant when it comes to shot attempts, shot quality. Yada, yada, yada. No, they, they definitely are. I did want to ask you because we are not seeing a lot of Ty Delandria. We are seeing more of Sam Steele. And I wanted to get your thoughts as far as Delandria sitting as much as uh, he has uh, and Steele getting the call on that fourth line. It, it, it's crazy to me because, for one, I think Sam Steele deserves to be an everyday NHL -er. Yeah. Um, but Ty, so should Ty Delandria. I mean, this is a guy with just one less game and three less points last year would have been a rookie, a rookie with 30 points, right? So if you package that in that kind of superficial way, that sounds amazing. And that's pretty much what he was close to, right? He had 27. The only reason he wasn't a rookie is because he played 26 games the season before, or maybe even like two seasons before. But, um, and, and a lot of things that Delandria does, I think are things that, that, um, that I think the team can really benefit from with the fourth line in being a grindy two-way player, but also has some functional passing. He has a shot. And sorry, facts of fans, but man, I, what I wouldn't give to see just Steele with Delandria and Smith on that fourth line. And uh, no disrespect to Faxa, but I, I when I think about the money, for example, like I just think, I, I think they should both be in the lineup. And the only player I can think of that could come out in that scenario would be Faxa because Craig Smith has been fantastic. Hasn't been productive lately, but he's been really good. Yeah. Got an empty netter tonight, but yeah, I would like to see um, Ty, I mean, you know, cause I, I want to make a decision on Ty Delandria's future. And so, you know, I, I'd like, and I do think he provides a lot of energy. It's not that Sam Steele's been bad. So, I mean, I think it's a good problem that listen, I think there are going to be, you know, hopefully not knock on wood, but there are going to be injuries. And I think that that's where the, you know, the stars, I mean, we want Thomas Harley back, but it's real nice to have Joel Hanley that can uh, step in. Uh, all right. Uh, we did have um, another candidate. 
Um, let's see. Real quick, uh, I would yeah. not be surprised at all if, ty- let's say an expansion team, say Houston, starts yeah. next year. Yeah. And they don't protect Delandria. I would not at all be surprised if Delandria was like another William Carlson. Just saying. I, like They need I to agree. find out who he is. I, I agree. I, I think he has potential to do a lot of things. Uh, Billy Reynolds on Twitter says, put the Ludwig statue at the old number seven. Um, and uh, let's see. He's talking about Neil Broughton. <laughs> the old number seven club. The old oh, number okay. seven club. But you know what? Mr. Minnesota, um, he's hanging in the rafters and for good reason. That's a, uh, that was a pretty special, uh, pretty uh, special player. Cameron T. Gas. Uh, I missed getting my question in the other day when I was doing a uh, post game pod, but do we keep sitting Delhi? He has been better in all phases than steel. In my opinion, if can't send a good message to a young player, when you keep bringing him out following a good game and maybe I'm a little, I have past memories of Julius Honka sitting out and then coming in and being afraid to make a mistake and Brendan Dillon and like those Nils Lundqvist of, last year. Yeah, Nils Lundqvist last year, who I thought defensively played pretty well tonight. Um, so, yeah, I mean, those are in my mind when it comes to Ty, Ty Delandria. You know, it's it's uh, like, you know, obviously, we you know, we just talked about him, but I, I, I really, it, it's worth noting. And I realize the, the organization is probably not having this discussion. This is just a discussion amongst, um, you know, just easily irritated, overreacting fans like myself, uh, which is that it's not just Delandria, right? It's also Logan Stankoven and Maverick Bork, who are what I think third and fourth in AHL scoring right now, um, or, or at least top five. Yeah, um, they both have 18 points in 14 game or 15 games, and you know this this team is gonna I'm, they're gonna have to be willing to just be like, you know what? We're a really good team. We can afford to just bring in a young player and let them learn. I mean, that's that's I just yeah, like and to me, Delandria fits into that category, even though he doesn't, he's not as talented as Stankoven or Bork. He is somebody with NHL experience. Um, I think other than other than him taking penalties, played really well. And um I I don't it's not against the law to just forget about wins and losses for a second because you're going to be fine. One prospect playing 15 minutes or 12 minutes a night is not going to break you. It's not against the law to just let somebody play and just experiment, find out what they are, give them a leash, five games, whatever, and, and just let them, let them rip. And, and Delandria, he's, he's just got to be given an everyday spot. Yeah, absolutely. And I wanted to ask you, get your thoughts. Um, rumors swirling and Dallas Morning News picked up a report that um, Nikita Zadorov um, was rumored as far as a potential trade target for the Dallas Stars. And Sean and I offline were talking about this. First off, there's a massive issue salary cap wise that the teams would have to work out. But that aside, and that is a massive issue, um, I personally um, would love to wait, and I say give Bixel a shot. Um, And I wanted to get your thoughts, David, and you've been watching Bixel down there, and um, if you think that maybe by the All-Star break he might be ready, um, because... I think, you know, if I'm Calgary, any trade is going to involve currency because people will say, well, you know, trade Fox, uh, trade Marchment, trade, you know, and I'm like, I don't think Calgary wants those players. Why would Calgary want to take on those salaries? So to, to me, I understand why they're interested. It's a big defenseman uh, going to be a UFA after this year, uh, unrestricted free agent. But at the same time, I, you know, to me, it just doesn't excite me. What do you think? I agree with you. I, I do think that, you know, Zadorov is, is a player that, yes, he, he's a big, mean guy. By the way, man, 2013, uh, teams had a tough draft of defensemen. Seth Jones, Darnell Nurse, Rasmus Ristolainen, and Zadorov all picked in the top 15, and those are not, like, yeah. elite defensemen. But um, 
I, like Zdorov is definitely a player that I think would improve the speed. You know, he's a big guy, but he's also fast. He would improve the speed of the blue line. So I think he would help with the breakouts, which we even saw tonight. You know, I, I'm sorry, but Lindell and Hockenpah are just, for all their strengths, are not guys that are going to allow the Fords to move cleanly up ice. They just they Correct. don't have that ability. So Zadorov is not quite, you know, he's not a puck mover, but he is somebody that can chug along, move quickly, and really accelerate those breakouts and ultimately the rushes. So in that regard, he is probably, he would probably be the third best defenseman, right? I think even breakout-wise, behind Heisken, Harley, even more than Lundqvist. Um, and then, of course, he gives you that physicality that I'm sure people are going to love during the playoffs. But he's also a player that takes a lot of penalties. He's a player who's really fluctuated, too. Like, his offense comes alive some seasons, but then his defense lags. And then sometimes he grades out extremely well defensively. And you wonder how much of that is the result of, say, like Calgary's system, you know, like a couple of years ago. And so, uh, yeah, he, he's t- he's 100% buyer's beware even if I would come to accept it, because I think he's decent, especially given what Dallas has to work with. But um, yeah, no, I, to me, that's not the move. I think, and to your point, Bixel, man, I, I'm a big believer. I try to be objective, try to take off my fan guard. Sure. And yet I still, I, to me, he just, he reminds me so much of Chris Tanev, so much. And it's important for people to understand that he has taken over the second uh, unit power play duties it was given to christian Cairo, who's kind of more of your classic puck mover but big Cell just is so um just heady and intelligent with his decision making he's not a player that it, oddly enough he doesn't even use the walls you would think a player like him would use the walls no he uses the middle of the ice a lot and so i'm starting to think that, that offensive that offense in him is maybe just untapped they're clearly seeing that which is why he's on the second unit so I'm 100% for just bring Bixel up. I mean, if you if you feel like you need someone like Zadorov, given his profile, forget about it. Just bring Bixel up. Now, yeah. if we're talking about bringing in Chris Tanev, that's a different story. Yeah, now we're yeah. Talking. I agree. I, I, I totally agree. So uh, Nashville takes down Colorado 4-3. to three, <laughs> So um, it's the NHL, folks. So did, did, did you see what happened? No, I didn't. So, so Colorado was winning 3-2. 20 some 28 seconds or 24 seconds before Nashville scored uh what was it two goals within 16 seconds to win in regulation oh (laughs) wow yeah I I gotta watch highlights because uh Gregory Finley our great producer was saying that Boston and Tampa went at it hard tonight too so some uh some good games so the way it stands right now stars up by three in the central over Colorado and tied for second the winnipeg jets so winnipeg hanging around kudos to that organization a lot of a lot of people thought that organization was going to be in flux they had attendance issues uh, obviously thought some prayers to the bonus family for what happened um so it's just it's one of those things where i mean stick tap to the jets because uh, i think they're um right now playing above what many thought they would no real quick just to because I'm someone that like, again, um, <laughs> with, with sort of, you know, kind of, and like I said, respect to bonus, his wife, his family. Yeah. Um, uh, still like kind of always going to be like critical of kind of that style, but he has a roster in which that can work. And it's important to remember that Winnipeg is, you know, without Velarde right now. And I think they're uh, missing somebody else on the blue line. So yeah. Um, they're they're absolutely a dark horse team right now, and I did not respect that going into the season, but I do now. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, love Connor Hellebuck. Um, he's terrific. Um, but yeah, you're right. Interesting. And I believe Patrick Lane was uh, scratched tonight, right? Uh, the um, for Columbus. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Columbus. yeah. Columbus is just such a shoddily run organization, man. That is, oh my goodness. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He was he was scratched. So yeah, as the ads play, as I try to look it up on the fly. <laughs> That's how we roll. Trying to get you the most uh, up to date information. So, uh, David's a beast. I will tell you, we're gonna have a Vegas preview coming up. Uh, as tomorrow we speak to Spitz and Suds friends Lindsey Brown, um, and get her thoughts. She covers the Vegas Knights, and she was also a former 
uh, Division One uh, beast in net. So she's terrific, and uh, she knows her puck. So excited to ask her about uh, Jake Ottinger, get her thoughts on uh, Vegas as they – uh, continue to um, mow through uh, teams just like they did last year. So it's going to be a, a real good preview that we'll give you tomorrow on uh, Spits and Suds. So that'll be released probably tomorrow afternoon to get you ready for that Wednesday late night tilt for Stars fans heading to the arena. It is going to be a 8.30 start. If you are going to the arena, I did want to point out, take a little time. The NHL has a mobile museum that celebrates diversity and talks about firsts as far as black players, as um, far as just uh, female players, uh, sled players, um, just, just all kinds of inclusion. And they have a virtual reality set up and it's, it's great. It was in uh, far it's in farmer's branch. uh, I believe tomorrow, uh, or it was in Farmer's Branch, yeah, tomorrow, and then it'll be uh, at the AAC on uh, Wednesday. So the tour takes about 15 minutes, completely free. So if you have kids, it's uh, great to see, um, and it's touring all the NHL cities. David, thank you so much for taking the time. Happy Thanksgiving to you and your family. Um, you are a beast, my friend. Check him out at Star Stack at D Magazine. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And we can all go to bed now happy because the Stars pick up a victory against a great opponent, the New York Rangers. They double them up 6-3, to three, and we will talk to you tomorrow on Spits and Suds. Thank you once again for all your support. We'll talk to you soon. <laughs>